Good morning, everybody. I'm glad that you've joined us online. I'm here in the auditorium. Oren's at the back of the auditorium running the PowerPoint and all the computer stuff this morning. And I'm up here, and you're at home. These are tough times. As most of you know by now, the virus, the pandemic has hit our city. It's uh, our city, our, our little town of, of St. John. We all know people who've been exposed. Uh, many are in quarantine. One has already died. We're very, very concerned and very anxious. And so in their wisdom, the elders have, have asked that we join together online. So I'm glad that you're here. And you're here in my heart as well. We love each other and care for each other, and we pray for one another. So today, please be safe. Please join us in worship, and we will continue to celebrate. You know, I'm reminded in 1917, the uh, really the, the, the mother church, the founding congregation of most of the churches of Christ here in South Central Kansas was the old Peace Creek Church. And during the Spanish flu epidemic, they actually had to close their services as well for three months. So we're not experiencing anything new. All that we're doing is learning to trust that God is in control. And he's in control of this. And isn't it wonderful that we can meet together online? Praise God and uh, be sure and click the like button as well. Let's join our hearts together and worship. The first thing that we want to do this morning, though, is to offer a very special prayer. Our children are getting ready to return to school. There are teachers and bus drivers and cooks and all of the staff, and they're being exposed, and we worry, and and we know the place to take our worries and our anxieties. Let's take it to the Lord now as Oren leads us in a very special prayer. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, our hearts reach out to you for guidance and help as our loved ones, whether they be teachers, students, bus drivers are all going back to school in the coming weeks. There's a lot of anxiety, Lord. Please help our administrators, decision makers to make wise choices, to keep the, the interest of our young children in their minds, in their hearts, as they make these difficult decisions. It will be difficult, but we know that if we trust in you, all things are possible. We ask that you help guide our small community and our broader world as we work through this pandemic together to do so trusting in you. It's with that in mind, Lord, help us. Through your son's name we do pray, amen. In Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, we read, At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love, and with you, I am well pleased. Ever thought about those words? What had Jesus done? He was 30 years old, but he wasn't famous. No one outside of his little village of Nazareth really knew who he was. He had been a carpenter. In fact, Jesus at this point was an ordinary man, and that's the point of our communion thought this morning. God takes the ordinary and makes something extraordinary come out of it. Jesus had been ordinary, but in God's eyes, he was extraordinary. As we prepare the communion, maybe you're scrambling this morning. A bit of flour, a bit of water, and a hot skillet. 
It makes the unleavened bread that represents the, the body of Jesus. The simple fruit juice, the fruit of the vine, represents his blood. God takes the ordinary and makes something extraordinary, extraordinary of it. And so this morning, as we give thanks, let's think about God who has taken our lives and transformed us from our ordinary day-to-day -day existence and made us into the sons and daughters of God. Let's take the bread now and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, King of the universe, thank you for loving even ordinary people. Thank you for transforming us into your sons and daughters. Lord, as we partake of this bread, simple water, simple flour, it's transformed into the remembrance of the body of your blessed son. Help us to partake in a worthy manner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's take the fruit of the vine and offer a prayer remembering that to us as Christians, this is more than just the fruit of the vine, but it represents the blood of Christ, his life given in our stead. Let's pray. Lord God, King of the universe, our heavenly Father, who looks down upon us in our, our smallness, in our ordinariness, and you lift us up and you transform us into the glorious family of God. May we drink this wine remembering the blood of Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's continue our worship. Well, it's my turn. We're, we'll get this together. I'm sorry about that, Orrin. All right. Today we're talking about the last of the seven deadly sins, the sin of gluttony. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, wrote in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 2, put a knife to your throat if you're given to gluttony. We're talking about the seven deadly sins, pride, envy, wrath, uh, lust, uh, sloth, <laughs> uh, avarice, or greed, and finally today we talk about gluttony. But the greatest, the greatest hurdle to understanding gluttony is to think that it only pertains to food. Some people can't have enough toys or television, entertainment, sex, or company. Gluttony is about the excess of anything, and as we think deeply about that subject this morning, we think deeply about this sin that divides us from God, there are three forms of gluttony that we would like to, like to look at. The first is wanting more pleasure from something than it was made for. The second is wanting it exactly our way and no other way, what we call delicacy. And third, demanding too much from people, an excessive desire for other people's time or presence. I like Pringles. I like potato chips. But there's a problem, because when you open the top of a can of potato, the first one is wonderful. And so, naturally, I want another and another and another. It seems that I, I just can't stop. And before I know it, I've eaten the entire can, whether it's Pringles or whether it's uh, a box of candy or, or <laughs> whatever it may be. We just can't help ourselves. We just can't stop. We have no self-control. We think that if I had more, if one makes me happy, then two will make me twice as happy and three times and so forth. And we do that not just with food, but we also do it with television, 
I'm just going to watch one more show. I'm an addict. And really, that's the best modern word for gluttony. It's an addiction and an addictive behavior. Let's look at those three forms of gluttony. The first one was wanting more pleasure than it was made for. It's possibly to be caught up in pleasure, whether food or fun. So caught up that we can no longer enjoy other things. And we would be willing to sacrifice other pleasures for this one. I'll give up spending time with my children if I can just watch one more episode. I'll give up spending time with my wife if I can just watch one more episode. We become addicted. We enter into gluttony when we demand more pleasure for something than it was made for. Normally, we can only eat so much food, but people in ancient Rome wanted more pleasure. They enjoyed eating, and so they would go and make themselves vomit after a meal so that they would be empty and they could enjoy even more. That kind of sick behavior is addiction. There's another form of, of addiction, and it's called delicacy. In the screw tape letter, C.S. Lewis describes delicacy, quote, as a desire to have things exactly our way. He gives the example of food having to be prepared just right or just the right amount, but it isn't limited to food. We might complain about unimportant defects in a product, the temperature of the room, the color of the laundry basket. There is a certain amount of discomfort to be expected in life, but the glutton will have none of it. Instead of becoming strong by suffering the minor desires and inconveniences of life, the glutton insists on being pampered. No one dares to point out how petty or foolish they are. In fact, some celebrities are praised for their excessive perfectionism as though it were a virtue. Well, there's also a third form of of gluttony, and that's demanding too much from people. Let me explain. There can be a healthy and natural enjoyment of time spent with friends and acquaintances, but some people just can't get enough. They make demands until the other person moves away or explodes in anger. The glutton is wounded that someone would take offense at their love for them. At least some people can get away. Far worse is when a parent demands too much from a child, requiring too much time or too many accomplishments from someone too small to grant so many pleasures. Even pets get excessive attention at times. Of course, my cat doesn't seem to mind all that much. You know, in some dating relationships, one person desires the other person's company constantly to the point that the other person can barely hold down a job or continue in school. Uh, whatever the reasons, the object of affection is expected to provide the pleasure of their company, at least, more of the time than is reasonable. They expect you to answer their text message immediately, to call them back immediately, to answer their emails immediately. And even in marriage, it is possible for a couple to be so romantic that the children are neglected. One legitimate pleasure, sex can become obsessive to the point that another pleasure, the company of one's children, is lost. Now for the good news. Because gluttony is generally a sin of the flesh, our flesh naturally limits it. We black out or we become bloated or, or it explodes. We consume too much food or drink and our body usually lets us know, either by gaining weight or by illness. If we're too fussy about things, delicacy, people will tell us to do it ourselves. And if we demand too much from people, they will fly away from us and we will be alone more often. So, Usually, we get a view of the problem and a chance to change. The cure for gluttony lies in deliberately reducing our use of pleasurable things, not in eliminating them. When eating, quit before feeling stuffed. When snacking, don't just keep stuffing, but quit after a while. With people, allow some quiet time together. 
and also get some time alone. Of course, if time alone is very pleasurable, get out more often. And if the toast is a bit too brown, eat it anyway. Let's open our Bibles together to a little book at the end of the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 1. And the first subject that he talks about is really the key to helping us overcome gluttony. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. All right, put your thinking caps on. Invite the Holy Spirit to help you understand this passage, and let's look at it phrase by phrase. First, his divine power comes through, quote, the knowledge of him, Jesus. And the word knowledge here is the full knowledge, the growing knowledge. And so if we want to become deeper Christians, if we want to be disciples, if we want to overcome gluttony, we need to focus on Jesus, to think about our example, to think about the way that he walked, the way that he lived, the way that he talked. Focus on Jesus. And we begin to experience power. Next, Peter says, Jesus calls us to glory and excellence. Glory. Glory is that awesome experience. We're not called to the drudgery of a day. It gets stale and pale and grows old over time. We are called to the now, the glorious now. We are called Excellence, not mediocrity. He is called, he is likewise granted us his promises. And notice there are two qualities of the promise. Number one, the promises of Jesus are precious, they are valuable. Think about the promise that he has given us to be there with us, that we'll never be alone. The promise that he's given us of, of hope, the promise that he's given us of wisdom. There are so many wonderful promises, and they are precious, and they are great. It's not just an ordinary thing that we've been called to. And then Peter tells us it is through the promises that we become partakers of the divine nature. I'd like you to ponder that for a little bit this afternoon that we have been called to a higher existence to leave this humdrum, ordinary world. In this world, you, you may not be looked upon as very much. You remember Jesus was just a carpenter, but God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Not Jesus the miracle worker, not Jesus the preacher, but Jesus the ordinary guy, the carpenter in a tiny village. We have been called to greatness. We are partakers in the divine nature. And secondly, we escape the worldly corruption. Look at that last phrase. Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire, the, the desires of our body, desires of our flesh, we can overcome the physical because of of the spiritual. Think about these things this afternoon. Think about them this week as we learn to grow closer to God, as we learn to live in glory and excellence. Thank us today, thank you for being here with us. And as we close, I'd like you to do two things for me. Number one, pick up the phone Pick up your computer, send a message to 
one of your brothers or sisters and tell them how much you love them and how much you miss them today, but we are praying for each other. And number two, I'd like you to think about Moses. Moses went up on top of the mountain, and when he came back down, his face was glowing. He had been changed by his encounter with God. We have had an encounter with God today. Are you glowing? Think about that as you leave the house today. Moses, because of his encounter, he frightened people, and so he had to put a mask on. And so today, when you leave your house and you have to put your mask on, think about the encounter with God that we have just experienced. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, King of the universe, it's beyond our understanding. It's beyond our grasp to, to know why you would love us so. But, Father, your love transforms us. It changes us. And so, Father, help me today to be a little bit more patient, to be a little bit more loving, to be a little bit more hopeful, to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. May we protect each other. And Lord, may you protect us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless everybody. We'll see you next week.